This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Section 1 You will hear a young student, Andrew, ringing an employment agency inquiring about their services. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, is this the AAA Employment Agency? Yes. Hi, I rang before. My name's Andrew, Andrew Peterson. I rang you earlier and gave you my personal details. The student's name is Andrew Peterson. So, Peterson has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello, is this the AAA Employment Agency? Yes. Hi, I rang before. My name's Andrew, Andrew Peterson. I rang you earlier and gave you my personal details. If you remember, I'm that student looking for work during the summer holidays. Oh, sure. Actually, I have your file right here. But we still need to add some further information. Yeah, that's what they told me, and that's why I'm ringing. What do you need to know? Well, we have to know your main level of education. It's a degree, I suppose. Yes, but I'm still doing it in engineering. It's quite interesting. Some of my friends are studying computing, though, so I'm interested in that also. Well, I'll just write in your main degree subject, engineering. We usually have a demand in computing, though. Have you worked with computers before? No, I just do some programming for fun at the university, but I almost got a job as a computer designer once. Actually, the only job I've ever had was as a car salesman, believe it or not. Well, at least you've had experience dealing with customers. What about hobbies, though? Sometimes they can help develop useful skills. Um, in my free time I don't do much, mostly study. I play chess occasionally at the university chess club. That's right next to the tennis courts, but I'm not interested in that. Chess helps develop analytical skills, so I'll put that down. Of course, it's your main skills that employers want to know about. What would you say they are? Well, I'm in my third year now, studying electrical machines and generating systems, but I'd say electronics is my best skill, much better than, say, my machine skills, which aren't so good, actually. OK. Machine skills are in demand, but so too are electronic ones. So we might be able to find your part-time job in that field. But what sort of money do you expect to get? Oh, anything, really. I'd want the standard payment, let's say. What's normal? 1000 a month? 1500 I'll just put $1,200, OK? That's fine by me. When can you start? Say, within two days? Easily. Actually, less. In fact, just give me a ring and I'll be able to start immediately. Although I admit it'll take me a few days to get used to getting up early in the morning. OK, that's just about it. Unless you'd like to add anything else which may help with your application? Uh, not really. I ride a motorbike, but that's unimportant. I'm friendly, but every applicant claims that, right? I can speak another language. Ah, that might be useful, depending on the language. Is it Chinese? A Chinese speaker would go down well. Spanish, I'm afraid. You see, I grew up with some friends who came from South America. OK, I'll write that down. 
But I don't think it will help that much. Sorry to say. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen, and answer questions eight to ten. Well, thanks for your help, and hopefully I'll get a job soon. But can I just ask one more question? Sure. What basically are employers looking for when they interview someone? Oh, many things. Being hardworking, diligent, and focused on your job is good. But surprisingly, it often means you can't see the bigger picture, or provide suggestions which help the company move forward. That requires thinking for yourself, outside the box, as they say, and being free of the standard ways of approaching tasks. Employers certainly value that. I guess experience must help, though. It depends. If it involved a routine job, one which didn't exercise your mind, it might not mean that much at all. But since companies are basically composed of people, it is important to be able to get along with others. There's no point in hiring someone whom the other employees don't like, right? That just causes problems. In fact, I would say that being friendly and approachable ranks far more highly than your academic qualifications. Okay, and that's all assessed at the interview, right? Yes, and your qualifications, experience, and approach to the job, such as whether you can do different things, work overtime, or do long hours, is needed. But those latter qualities are pretty much standard. What may be more important is based on the fact that things inevitably go wrong. Mistakes are made, and someone's got to fix them in a way that creates the least disturbance. People with demonstrated abilities to do this are certainly regarded highly. I see. That's very interesting. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Part two. You will hear a guide. At a tourist attraction called Oniton Hall, talking to a group of visitors. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Good morning, and welcome to Oniton Hall, one of the largest estates in the area. My name's Nick, and I'm one of the guides. I'll give you a brief introduction to the estate while you're sitting down, and then we'll walk round. The estate consists of the house, gardens. Parkland and farm, and it dates back to the 14th century. The original house was replaced in the late 17th century, and of course it has had a large number of owners. Almost all of them have left their mark, generally by adding new rooms, like the ballroom and conservatory, or by demolishing others. The farm looks much as it's always done, although the current owner has done a great deal of work to the flower beds. In the seventeenth century, the estate was owned by a very wealthy man called Sir Edward Downs. His intention was to escape from the world of politics, after years as an active politician. And to build a new house worthy of his big collection of books, paintings, and sculptures, he broke off contact with his former political allies and hosted meetings of creative and literary people, like painters and poets. Unusually for his time, he didn't care whether his guests were rich or poor, 
as long as they had talent. Big houses like Oniton had dozens of servants until the 1920s or 30s, and we've tried to show what their working lives were like. Photographs, of course, don't give much of an idea. So instead, as you go round the house, you'll see volunteers dressed up as 19th century servants going about their work. They'll explain what they're doing and tell you their recipes or what tools they're using. We've just introduced this feature to replace the audio guide we used to have available. I see there are a number of children here with you today. Well, we have several activities, especially for children, like dressing up in the sorts of clothes that children wore in the past. And as it's a fine day, some of you will probably want to play in the adventure playground. Our latest addition is child-sized tractors that you can drive around the grounds. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. We'll also be going into the farm that's part of the estate, where there's plenty to do. Most of the buildings date from the 18th century, so you can really step back into an agricultural past. Until recently... The dairy was where milk from the cows was turned into cheese. It's now the place to go for lunch, or afternoon tea, or just a cup of coffee and a slice of homemade cake. The big stone building that dominates the farm is the large barn, and in here is our collection of agricultural tools. These were used in the past to plough the earth, sow seeds, make gates, and much more. There's a small barn, also made of stone, where you can groom the donkeys and horses to keep their coats clean. They really seem to enjoy having it done, and children love grooming them. The horses no longer live in the stables, which instead is the place to go to buy gifts, books, our own jams and pickles, and clothes and blankets made of wool from our sheep. Outside the shed, which is the only brick building, you can climb into a horse-drawn carriage for a lovely relaxing tour of the park and farm. The carriages are well over a hundred years old. And finally, the parkland, which was laid out in the 18th century with a lake and trees that are now well established. You'll see types of cattle and sheep that are hardly ever found on farms these days. We're helping to preserve them, to stop their numbers falling further. OK, well, if you'd like to come with me, we will start... That is the end of part two. Section three. You will hear two faculty directors talking about which person in their university to promote. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. OK, we've got to decide who to promote to leading education officer. Someone from the arts faculty, I suppose. 
Well, it can be from any faculty, since the position requires more general skills, handling personnel, settling disputes, and motivating them to focus on the task. It was the last position which involved computer knowledge, not this one. Surely, computer knowledge would help. So too would knowledge in the arts. Sure, it would help. But the key criterion is being able to direct the staff appropriately. So it doesn't matter then from which faculty we select our candidates. Not really, but I've already looked at those from computing and rejected them all. Why? They're all too new, lacking in sufficient experience. Whereas these ones from the business faculty are long timers. So we'll take someone from there. I suppose you're right. The arts faculty doesn't present much in the way of suitable candidates either. But we'll still have to train the person, teach the ropes, as they say, and he or she will have to expect to do overtime as needed. Of course, it can get so busy that if we were open on the weekend, they'd have to work then as well. Just as well, we're a Monday to Friday university, right? Right. But are you sure these people will actually want the job? The salary isn't such an improvement on their current ones. I know, but there are benefits. You get overtime rates. A nice place to put your car, as well as additional petrol money if you drive for company purposes, which they'll probably be required to do. But those benefits are quite limited, especially given all the work and responsibility involved. People often don't like that; they prefer the creative freedom of less senior teaching positions. Yeah, I know. But these candidates should realise that if they do this job well, there'll be more promotions down the line. You know how everyone likes having their own office, right? Sure. Well, that would come after a few years if they're prepared to work hard and grow with the university. Yes, that should attract these people. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Well, that's enough talk about the job. What about the actual candidates? How many do we have? Ah,、uh, I've narrowed it down to four. Ah,、uh, just using their first names. That's Stephen, Abdul, Lek, and Oscar. As you said, there's quite a bit of experience between them, about thirty-four years in all. What's the exact breakdown of figures? Abdul and Stephen both have seven years. Lek has one more, and Oscar is the most experienced at twelve. But who's the most qualified? Stephen and Abdul have an MBA.、Oh, sorry, Abdul's got something called a MBP, some foreign thing which translates as Master of Business Practice. I'm not sure what that is, but does he do the job well? Very well, apparently. Better than Lek and Oscar, who hold a degree and some certificates, respectively. But we have to think about any drawbacks, you know, possible issues with any of them. I asked the respective deans for feedback, and I found out that Stephen, the younger one, drinks a bit. So he has a problem with alcohol. No, he never drinks to excess, but at the bar he's often expressed his intention of moving on, of teaching abroad. Ah, he's not stable. Not stable at all, apparently. We'll never know for how long he'll hold the job. We need stable personnel. And people without family problems or sick relatives, like the last guy we promoted. What about Abdul? Then will he do? He might do, except his English language ability is limited. It's functional but a bit broken, and meaning is sometimes lost. That's not the problem with the next candidate, Lek, who has good language ability. But this job involves handling people, and his dean says Lek's attitude is bad. In what way? His manners are okay, and he's interested in his job, but he believes there should always be adequate leisure in life. He definitely won't work overtime, and complains a lot already about his job. But this last candidate, Oscar, is probably not the right one either. Why not? Not another problem with language. His first language isn't English, but he speaks it well enough. He's stable with a good attitude, but his age is the problem. Age is not a problem. That would be ageism. And I don't believe in that. But with his age comes health problems as well, and serious ones at that. Oh, that might be an issue then. That is the end of section three.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Part 4. You will hear a lecturer on a languages course talking about the impact of digital technology on Icelandic, the native language of Iceland. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Right, everyone. Let's make a start. Over the past few sessions, we've been considering the reasons why some world languages are in decline. And today I'm going to introduce another factor that affects languages and the speakers of those languages, and that's technology, and in particular, digital technology. In order to illustrate its effect, I'm going to focus on the Icelandic language, which is spoken by around 321,000 people, most of whom live in Iceland, an island in the North Atlantic Ocean. The problem for this language is not the number of speakers, even though this number is small, nor is it about losing words to other languages, such as English. In fact, the vocabulary of Icelandic is continually increasing, because when speakers need a new word for something, they tend to create one, rather than borrowing from another language. All this makes Icelandic quite a special language. It's changed very little in the past millennium, yet it can handle 21st century concepts related to the use of computers and digital technology. Take, for example, the word for web browser. This is Vafri in Icelandic, which comes from the verb to wander. I can't think of a more appropriate term because that's exactly what you do mentally when you browse the internet. Then there's an Icelandic word for podcast, which is too hard to pronounce, and so on. Icelandic, then, is alive and growing, but, and it's a big but, young Icelanders spend a great deal of time in the digital world, and this world is predominantly English. Think about smartphones. They didn't even exist until comparatively recently. But today, young people use them all the time to read books, watch TV or films, play games, listen to music and so on. Obviously, this is a good thing in many respects because it promotes their bilingual skills. But the extent of the influence of English in the virtual world is staggering and it's all happening really fast. For their parents and grandparents, the change is less concerning because they already have their native speaker skills in Icelandic. But for young speakers, well, the outcome is a little troubling. For example, teachers have found that playground conversations in Icelandic secondary schools can be conducted entirely in English, while teachers of much younger children have reported situations where their classes find it easier to say what is in a picture using English rather than Icelandic. The very real and worrying consequence of all this is that the young generation in Iceland is at risk of losing its mother tongue. Of course, this is happening to other European languages too. But while internet companies might be willing to offer, say, French options in their systems, it's much harder for them to justify the expense of doing the same for a language that has a population the size of a French town, such as Nice. The other drawback of Icelandic is the grammar, which is significantly more complex than in most languages. 
At the moment, the tech giants are simply not interested in tackling this. So, what is the Icelandic government doing about this? Well, large sums of money are being allocated to a language technology fund that it is hoped will lead to the development of Icelandic sourced apps and other social media and digital systems. But clearly this is going to be an uphill struggle. On the positive side, they know that Icelandic is still the official language of education and government. It has survived for well over a thousand years, and the experts predict that its future in this nation-state is sound and will continue to be so. However, there's no doubt that it's becoming an inevitable second choice in young people's lives. This raises important questions. When you consider how much of the past is tied up in a language, will young Icelanders lose their sense of their own identity? Another issue that concerns the government of Iceland is this. If children are learning two languages through different routes, neither of which they are fully fluent in, will they be able to express themselves properly? That is the end of part four.